Hi, we're recording. First of all, thank you all for joining us today. This is the fifth talk of our multi-part webinar series on New Zealand mud snails in the Great Lakes region. As you may be aware, New Zealand mud snails are an invasive species that have relatively recently been found in inland rivers and streams in the Great Lakes region, which raises concerns about their further spread and potential impacts on our local aquatic systems. This webinar series is brought to you by the Great Lakes New Zealand Mud Snail Collaborative and aims to improve knowledge on the ecosystem impacts of mud snails, develop strategies to minimize their spread, inform management initiatives, and raise public awareness. If you want to learn more about the collaborative or get more involved, you can visit our website at nzmscollaborative.org or email us at info at nzmscollaborative.org. Couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat box at any time. I will collect them and uh, ask them at the end. If we don't have time to get through everyone's questions, um, we will follow up with you individually via email. And lastly, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be available to you on the website, which again is ncmscollaborative.org uh, in just a few days. And you can find all of our past uh, webinars here as well. And if you have trouble finding it, you can always email me or info at ncmscollaborative.org. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Jeremy Geist. Jeremy is the Great Lakes Stream Restoration Manager for Trout Unlimited. He oversees restoration and monitoring activities throughout the state and works with state and federal agencies, academic institutions, conservation organizations, and citizen scientists to protect, reconnect, and restore cold water aquatic systems. Jeremy has a bachelor's degree in conservation ecology from Northern Michigan University and a master's degree in biology with an emphasis in stream ecology from Oakland University. He is currently a PhD candidate at Oakland University studying New Zealand mud snails in the Osable River. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Jasmine. <clears throat> uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Happy we could all join in on vacation season here. And I typically do the introductions for these webinar series, but since I'm the speaker this time, we thought it'd be a little bit weird and awkward. So Jasmine, thanks for that intro. Um, <clears throat> and can you hear and see me just fine and the slides just to double check? Yep. Okay, how about my cursor? Can you see my cursor? I can. Okay, great. So I'm gonna jump off video just for connection purposes and we'll dive right into the presentation here. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so as Jasmine mentioned, um, I'll be giving a talk about some of the research that's coming out of the um, Aquatic Ecology Lab at Oakland University um, under uh, Dr. Scott Teagues. Um, and this talk is entitled The Effects of New Zealand Mud Snail in a Michigan uh, Trout Stream. And certainly want to acknowledge the co-authors and co-contributors to the um, results and the information you're going to be seeing throughout the presentation. Um, Jasmine Mancuso, <coughs> Kennedy Arrio, Emily Beauvais, Morgan Morin, Diana Thaya, and Scott Teagues. Um, so uh, New Zealand mud snails, common acronym for them is NZMS. So you're going to hear me use NZMS, mud snails, New Zealand mud snails all interchangeably, so just to give a little disclaimer there. Um, just a quick outline about um, the talk that's about to uh, follow here, uh, just broken up into a few parts, starting with a bit of background about the ecology, the life history, uh, morphological traits of mud snails, and then moving on to an evaluation of mud snail population dynamics and their effects on native or resident invertebrates, um, particularly in the Osaba River. Um, thereafter, um, talk about evaluating the effects of New Zealand mud snails on the diet and physiological condition of trout in the Osaba River. And then lastly, and hopefully we'll have time for um, a quick uh, mention about a lab experiment we have done and the study to determine a practical approach for mud snail decontamination for fishing waders through disinfectant efficacy testing and public input. And so to start us off with just some very fundamental background information that um, I presume and assume we all are very aware of on this, this subject, but good to reemphasize and reiterate is that the Great Lakes are generally an invasive species hotspot. Um, biotic invasions are a leading threat to ecosystems worldwide. 
Under human influence, species are now being transferred between regions faster and farther than at any other time in Earth's history. And as a result, uh, the economic burden of, the, of invasive species management in the US alone are an estimated $130 billion per year. And few habitats remain free of invasions in part as a result of an increase in global trade and recreation. And aquatic systems are among the most heavily invaded with freshwaters being particularly vulnerable. And among those freshwater systems are our Laurentian Great Lakes, which are a global hotspot for biological invasion. And this is due in part to the relatively recent retreat of the last glacial formations during the end of the Pleistocene, leaving behind about 20% of the Earth's surface freshwater and open ecological niche space. This coupled with anthropogenic disturbances and commercial shipping, which accounts for about 30% of species introduced through ballast exchange, along with the pet trade and recreation, has made the Great Lakes a highly, suscept uh, highly susceptible to invasions. Oops, apologies, I had a pop up on the bottom here. Um, so among recent aquatic invaders, um, obviously the New Zealand mud snails have relatively recently been discovered uh, in the region. <clears throat> and again, if you've tuned in to the last few presentations, um, some of this is gonna be redundant and has been well covered in the past, but it's also important enough to reiterate, reemphasize, and to set the stage for the rest of the talk. So New Zealand mud snails, as their name implies, uh, they're native to New Zealand and the surrounding islands. They appear amber to brown, dark brown in coloration as we're seeing in these pictures over here. In their invasive ranges, uh, they range anywhere from four to six millimeters at adulthood. And in their native ranges get a bit bigger than that, up to 12 millimeters. They have five to six whorls or spiraled segments of their shells. And some morphotypes exhibit a mid keel ridge as we're seeing here in this figure. They are dextral, meaning that when faced toward you, their opening occurs on the right-hand side and are operculate, um, meaning that they have the ability to close their aperture or opening, which gives them the ability to withstand environmental stressors such as desiccation, um, which or where mud snails have been documented to survive up to 50 days out of the water. Uh, continuing on, they are categorized as herbivores, detritivores, feeding on paraphyton, macrophytes, algae, um, detritus, leaf litter, etc. Um, they exhibit a rapid growth rate and can reach sexual maturity at about at three to three and a half minutes. <laughs> Uh, which take uh, which only take just a couple to a few months to get to that size. They are oviviparous, uh, meaning that they give live birth, um, produce live offspring. They are parthenogenic, uh, meaning that they reproduce asexually, uh, producing uh, clonal offsprings. Um, and are highly fecund. Reproduction can occur year round under suitable conditions. Um, and one individual mud snail can potentially produce tens of thousands of offspring per year. So in theory, you know, one individual mud snail can um, start a new invasive population in a previously uninvaded water body. And in aggregate, these life history traits really, really allow mud snails to resist and tolerate a wide array of environmental conditions during the invasion process and establish rapidly in new environments. So as a result of these life history characteristics, mud snails have colonized five continents, 39 countries, and 19 states in the US. As you'll see from um, this global map, we've generated based off of coordinates and range information from available literature and reports. Um, ma major pathways of dispersal, um, not uncommon than, uh, from other invasive species, uh, include commercial shipping and aquaculture for long distance transport. Uh, regional vectors of dispersal include human recreation and natural means such as drifting in stream currents and volitional movement where mud snails can travel about a meter per hour um, and also by attaching or hitching a ride through fish and wildlife. Uh, focusing in on the U.S. and the Great Lakes region, um, <clears throat> as many of us I'm sure are aware, they were first discovered in the U.S. in Idaho in the Snake River in 1987. Uh, thereafter have spread um, rapidly across most all Western US states. Um, in the Great Lakes region, they were first discovered in Lake Ontario in 1991. 
um, and then thereafter has spread to four out of the five Great Lakes, or at least been documented in four out of the five Great Lakes. And it wasn't until somewhat recently where they started um, being detected in inland streams and rivers of the, of the Great Lakes region with first occurrences in Pennsylvania in 2008, Wisconsin around 2012, and um, for the most part detected at first in Michigan in 2015 in inland streams and rivers. However, past uh, samples from um, water quality monitoring programs have determined that they were present in the rivers prior to 2015, particularly in the Boardman River, I think around 2012, 2013. So the, the widespread geographic distribution of mud snails reflects their ability to invade a broad range of habitats, such as streams and lakes and estuaries with both, uh, in both fresh and brackish water environments. And while they have a wide ranging tolerance to a variety of environmental and physiochemical conditions, optimum levels are apparent in the literature. Um, for example, as their name implies, mud snails are associated with fine sediments such as mud and organics often utilizing subsurface areas, um, burrowing or burying into fine sediment to seek refuge from higher velocities and predators. However, studies in their native and invasive range also imply and suggest that they are often associated and or prefer substrate that provides other refuge, such as interstitial space between cobble and pebble-sized rocks. Um, hydrologic conditions can influence mud snail invasions, where it's been demonstrated that higher velocities can affect establishment with currents over 15 meters per second shown to dislodge them from riverbed substrate. Uh, mud snails have a broad tolerance for physiochemical properties of aquatic systems, uh, where NZMS have been observed to tolerate temperatures as low as 9 degrees C up to 31 C. However, optimal levels of growth and reproduction seem to hover around 17 to 18 C. They can survive in a wide range of salinity concentrations as evidenced by their ability to colonize brackish water. Um, they can tolerate and perform in salinity concentrations from zero to up to 35 PPT, which is essentially full strength seawater. Um, however, mid-range levels anywhere up to five to 10 seem to be optimal for growth and reproduction. So zero up to five and a little bit beyond then. Uh, specific conductivity, specifically the presence of environmental calcium is needed by all mollusks for shell building. Um, and optimal levels for mud snails appear to lie at concentrations of about 200 microsiemens or greater. And overall, invasive lineages of mud snails have a wide tolerance for environmental conditions. However, optimal ranges do exist and likely influence their distribution, invasion success, and therefore impacts. And the ecological impacts of mud snails widely vary as well in the literature, with reports ranging from weak to strong adverse effects um, on native ecosystems and, and everywhere in between. Uh, nonetheless, mud snails have measurable effects on primary production by altering paraphyton assemblages through grazing. They can alter benthic community structure by outcompeting native taxa, specifically native snails, as they are a direct competitor of the same food resources. They can affect the physiological condition of fish that attempt to feed on them, as well as affect organic matter processing and nutrient cycling. Um, on this next slide here, once my bar goes down. Uh, we'll see one, I just want to give an example of one of the more dramatic impacts of mud snails uh, that occurred in an invaded stream in Wyoming where mud snail abundances can reach over 500,000 individuals per square meter. Um, as we're seeing in this upper right hand figure here in the study in Polecat Creek, you can see we've got density um, of mud snails on your y-axis and uh, time frame on your x with some pretty sky high density uh, estimates there. Um, as a result they're elevated, of their elevated densities, mud snails dominate secondary production relative to native macron rubbish, which is what we're seeing here in the lower right-hand figure. And in fact, they have the highest secondary production values ever reported among stream invertebrates. <clears throat> so I'll describe more of these impacts in, in the next few slides and throughout the talk, but overall, mud snails have the ability to impact both the biotic structure and ecological function of systems that they invade. And the degree of impact, in part, is often associated with their population abundance. And so before we move on too far, I just want to kind of touch on real quick some, some fundamental concepts of invasive species dynamics and population dynamics of invasive species. I'm sure many of us are familiar with these, but again, just touch on, touch on them quickly. Um, one of them is <coughs> this boom-bust concept. 
um, wherein invasive species undergo a rapid increase in population size upon introduction into a new environment, which is then followed by a collapse in population, hence the bust or population crash of the concept. And so a conceptual inter interpretation of this phenomenon is shown here, where we, in the left figure, where you can see somewhat of an exponential growth in population followed by a sudden decrease, and the figure to the right showing uh, these reoccurring oscillations of population growth and reductions over time, which has also been observed with uh, invasive species. And now the mechanisms behind these patterns are somewhat poorly understood, often because of population data being relatively noisier than what we see here in this conceptual, and because of a lack of reliable long-term data to help fully describe population trends. And just the second concept we'll touch quickly on is this abundance impact relationship, um, where some measure of abundance, whether it be biomass or density, for example, of an invasive population is related to its impact. Uh, so as seen in this figure, abundance impacts curves have varying shapes, linear, sigmoidal, et cetera, and likely depends upon the measure of abundance and the impact variable of interest. Um, also worth noting is the time since initial introduction of the species and the characteristics of the recipient or invaded system also likely influence this relationship. And so such concepts of the, as these are important to consider when trying to understand invasive species population dynamics and their associated impacts and are particularly relevant towards uh, New Zealand mud snails given their wide ranging impacts and abundances across their invaded range. So, a number of investigations have documented uh, apparent population boom bust patterns in MZMS invasions, um, such as what we're seeing here in the figures on our right. The upper two figures, um, Schreiber et al, 98, Cairns uh, and others, 05, describe uh, seasonal fluctuations of mud snail populations, where we have densities on the y-axis, time on the x, and you see these fluctuations or oscillations of population densities over these time frames. And this pattern has been seen elsewhere and is generally thought to be a common one observed with MZMS population dynamics and in invaded ranges. Uh, in the lower figure from Greenwood at all 20, um, a longer term pattern is described where biomass, which is on the y-axis, falls drastically in subsequent years of their investigation. So we've got kind of two patterns going on here, a short term fluctuations or dynamics, and then we've got a longer term, um, just all different time scales. <clears throat> So as mentioned, mud snails exhibit a wide range of densities across their invaded range. And the figure we're seeing here is merely just reported population data extracted from the literature when available. And just the point is it simply displays the variability, <coughs> excuse me, the variability in NZMS densities observed across investigations, which may also help to explain the variability of their observed impacts. So since Little is known about mud snail populations and their dynamics in the region. Um, and since they're relatively recent discoveries in our inland uh, streams and rivers, we wanted to evaluate mud snail population dynamics and examine their effects on native invertebrates of the Osawa River with the objectives to sample benthic communities seasonally to characterize population growth over time and then analyze benthic samples for community structural and functional composition relative to New Zealand mud snail presence. And so we focused in on the Asabo River um, uh, system and specifically on the east branch of the Asabo where mud snails were first detected around 2016. Uh, I'm sure many of us on this call know the Asabo River located in the northeast region of Michigan's lower peninsula and drains into Lake Huron. Um, the main stem of the Asabo is about 208 kilometers long with an additional 500 and change of tributaries. It's a designated cold water system and a trout stream and, and managed actively for brown trout um, and other game uh, fish species such as rainbow and brook trout exist. Uh, as such, the river is highly popular destination for tourism, specifically for river oriented recreation, such as angling and boating. Um, it's a recreational attraction for visitors across the region and, and throughout the country and probably elsewhere too. Um, as mentioned, mud snails were first found in the East Branch in 2016 and have since spread throughout the watershed. And because of its popularity among recreationists, the Osaba River is a potential source population for further mud snail spread within the state of Michigan and elsewhere. 
Uh, additionally, similar to that of other major rivers in northern Michigan, uh, for example, the Manistee River, which is right next door, the Osable exhibits relatively stable conditions in terms of its hydrology um, and physiochemical characteristics uh, such as water temperature, making it a potentially highly susceptible river for rapid mudsnail invasion and spread. Uh, for our benthic sampling, um, use standard practices um, using a quantitative approach with a HESS sampler, um, collecting triplicate samples from each of our study site locations here, which um, you can see in the upper right hand figure. Um, we collected samples seasonally, so approximately four times a year, um, preserved samples in the field, and then transported them back to the lab for enumeration, identification, and analyses. And so I'll jump right into some preliminary results from, from this work. Um, a lot of the results you see are preliminary, and we've still got a lot of samples and data to work up, but um, we have some stuff to share with you here. I'll jump right into this. So what we're finding um, is that mudsnail densities fluctuate seasonally and are increasing annually. So here again are some prelim uh, results um, of population trends from sampling years 2016, 2018, um, and into a little bit of 2019 here. And so what we're seeing with the figure on our left shows some seasonal variation <clears throat> occurring where densities are peaking in the summer and fall and then drop or reduce in the winter, early spring which is consistent with uh, you know, other seasonal trends seen in the literature and elsewhere. <clears throat> the figure on our right is showing just the summer densities of mud snails. The time when uh, mud snail abundances uh, presumably are in peak or we observe to be in peak. And over the three year sampling period shown here, uh, densities are increasing at a, an apparent or presumed exponential rate here. Um, Disclaimer, we realize that this is only a limited number of data points here to describe the rate of increase. But again, we've got subsequent years of data and are working to uh, fold that in to help characterize population trends and dynamics. So we're seeing that at peak abundances during the summers of 2017 and 18, uh, mud snails are dominating the benthic community, uh, which is what we're seeing here in this upper figure with our densities on our Y and season and year on our X, and showing that mud snails have greater densities than all other native invertebrates during summer at this particular site. Uh, using a non-metric multidimensional scaling ordination technique revealed that um, we have significant differences in our invertebrate community structure across our sampling sites. And this is largely driven by the presence and relative abundance of, of New Zealand mud snails. So this is an ordination plot. We won't get too deep into it right now, but you'll see different colorations and different clustering of those colors across. And these data points just represent different samples across of our sampling sites. And we've broken down mud snail abundance crudely into kind of um, uh, abundance thresholds from our raw abundance data from zero. So no, <clears throat> no mud snails to uh, quote, you know, high levels or high abundance of mud snails here. And we see that we have clustering and significant differences among these crude categories of mud snail abundances. And basically what this is saying that mud snail presence and abundance are driving differences in our invertebrate community structure across our sampling sites. And they are the highest contributing taxa to the variation in macroinvertebrate community composition among our sites as well too. So to touch a bit about um, mud snail feeding ecology growth um, and potential effects or influences on native taxa, I'll start off with just plugging a study done by Emily Bove in the lab, who um, <coughs> evaluated the um, enzymes growth based on the type of leaf loader they were reared upon. And so <coughs> uh, she found significant differences um, in it individual mud snail growth between the species of leaf litter, lit litter on which they were reared upon. In that snails reared on essentially cottonwood and ash had the most growth, the highest growth at the end of the experimental duration. You can see this up here in the upper right hand figure here. And these results su suggest that, you know, changing composition of forests in the Great Lakes region could impact mud snail growth and subsequently their invasion success. Dropping down to this middle figure and middle bullet um, in an isotope analysis using a two-source mixing model to determine resource use of mud snails in the Osaba River that Kennedy Bomarito and Abigail Gonzalez conducted from our lab. 
found that 35% of the carbon makeup of mud snails came from feeding upon par paraphyton and 65% came from leaf litter, indicating that they feed on both paraphyton and leaf litter, potentially impacting multiple compartments of the food webs. And so really in this figure, all you'll want to pay attention to is the kind of horizontal or lateral position of mud snails relative to a known grazer and a known shredder, which are essentially proxies for the food types. Um, mud snails falling uh, pretty much in between them, demonstrating that they you know, feed upon both types of resources. And now since mud snails are known as herbivores and results from the isotopic analysis revealed much of their carbon originates from paraphyton, competition with other grazers, i.e. other invertebrates in the stream, who also feed on paraphyton and algae is expected. And so if we move down here to this uh, last and uh, bottom figure, <clears throat> our preliminary results show that at high mud snail densities, grazer densities decrease um, with an apparent threshold occurring around mud snail densities of about 60,000 individuals per square meter year. So we've got grazer abundance on our Y, mud snail abundance on our X showing this kind of threshold and, and drastic reduction of grazer abundance around this level. And so altogether, these preliminary results show, uh, suggest that mud snails, especially at higher densities, have the potential to impact benthic community structure and food web dynamics in the system. Uh, so moving on to part three, um, we'll be talking about uh, evaluation of, and the effects of mud snails on the diet, um, more so the diet, but um, I'll talk Bit about, a little bit about the physiologic condition of trout in the Osawa River with the objectives to quantify uh, abundance and proportion of mud snails found in trout and other fish species diets, um, and then also evaluate the effects of mud snails on consumption on fish physiological condition. <clears throat> uh, so as we've learned, uh, mud snails, as mud snails invade aquatic systems, they can displace native invertebrates. Um, higher consumers such as fish may then incorporate mud snails into their diets. And the table we're seeing here is really just to provide an example that fish can incorporate mud snails as a prey item or food resource. Um, this red box indicates the abundance of <clears throat> mud snails found in the gut contents of these various fish species in a mud snail invaded Lithuanian lake, where I is the number of individual mud snails in the diet and S sub F is the proportion. And, and again, the, really the main takeaway is that benthivorous fish in this invaded system are feeding upon mud snails. Now, whether it's deliberate or incidental ingestion is unclear. And this is the case for many invaded systems that have had fish consumption investigations occurs. Really just the question is, are they really targeting them or is it incidental or accidental ingestion? Um, nevertheless, mud snails can be considered a poor food item. Uh, their hard shell gives them a high resistance to crushing and they have the ability to close their aperture, thereby resisting digestion after consumption. Um, they also have a low tissue to shell mass ratio, which is what we're seeing in this upper figure, um, displaying that mud snails have a low ratio relative to native snails here. That's what we're seeing on our left, which suggests that the nutritional value of mud snails are poor, is poor relative to native snail prey. Of fish that do substantially consume mud snails, effects on physiological condition has been observed. Uh, the figure on the bottom right are results of a study that's pretty widely known in the mud snail world <laughs> um, that took place in Idaho and showed reduced condition factor, which is a calculation of fitness based upon physical metrics, um, is lower in fish that consumed mud snails than that of those that did not. Um, and so this study is just one of the few, if not the only, that have investigated physical impacts of fish that fed upon mud snails and did so mostly at a hatchery or in a hatchery setting and in the Western US where ecosystems differ um, a bit than here in the Great Lakes region. And so again, our aim is to evaluate the effects of mud snails on um, trout and if it's influencing their diets and physical condition. Um, so to do this, we use the same sampling location study area of the East Branch of the Asaba River. <clears throat> um, we sampled fish annually, um, generally during the summer, um, using standard practices again, um, standard equipment, electrofishing backpack. Um, we uh, measured and weighed fish collected um, and did this um, annually again throughout the years 2016 to 2020. For our diet analysis, um, we used the pulse gastric lavage method in the field. Um, 
And then we also brought them back to the lab to um, for a complete gut content analysis uh, through dissection. So jumping into some of the preliminary results we're seeing right now, <clears throat> it's showing that as mud snail densities increase, consumption of NZMS by trout also increases. So in this upper figure here, over a three-year period, <clears throat> um, the proportion of trout uh, that consumed mud snails in the sample population increased by a rate of 58%. Now, if we recall during the same period, mud snail densities are also increasing in the stream. Uh, and in fact, in 2018, we found over 50 individual mud snails in an individual brown trout stomach, which is surprisingly a lot, um, a lot of mud snails to be found. <clears throat> We're also finding a, or seeing a significant positive association uh, between the proportion of mud snails in the gut content uh, of trout as NZMS densities increase in the stream. So this is the figure we're looking at right here with the proportion of mud snails in the gut on our Y and the uh, density of mud snails on our X there. And you can see a bit of a relationship occurring there, which basically shows that as mud snails become more prevalent in the stream, trout are increasingly incorporating them into their diets. Overall, excuse me, overall, our analysis is showing that trout are incorporating mud snails into their diets in the invaded stream. However, we still need to analyze whether it has an impact on their physiological conditions or fitness. We've got some early data that's showing uh, not much of a noticeable effect, but again, we've got uh, a few years of data to process and work up as well. So jumping into part four, which I'll touch on quickly and uh, deviates a little bit from our ecological studies here. Um, we wanted to test the effectiveness of common decontaminants of mud snails and improve understanding of the public's willingness to participate in a mud snail decontamination strategy um, to help for spread prevention efforts. Um, we had the objectives to evaluate three different commonly used chemicals that are presumed to be effective at killing mud snails. Um, and then also develop and distribute an online questionnaire to the angling community to understand willingness in using a decontamination strategy. I'm not going to touch on the online questionnaire yet. We're still folding them into the results and the analysis. So I'll, I'll more so focus on the evaluation of the chemical disinfectants. So as we know, mud snails spread by recreational means um, <clears throat> within and among water bodies. And these recreational means substantially um, facilitate spread across these regions. Uh, and specifically in Michigan, um, NZMS invaded ranges often overlap with popular fishing destinations, such as the Osawa River, making it particularly relevant and important to provide and determine practical approaches for general users. Uh, mud snails can attach to fishing gear, such as waders and boots, and because they can withstand periods of desiccation by closing their shell up, they are easily transported to other body, water bodies by these means. And now they're... Um, a number of, well, so this begs uh, the need for effective and practical decontamination strategies um, for recreationists who visit mud snail invaded waters. And now there's a number of various decontaminants that have been evaluated in the literature. However, contrasting results exist, making it a bit difficult for the public to discern which strategy is effective. Moreover, many of the decontaminants tested are difficult for the public to obtain easily and, and, and often require a multi-step process to use effectively. Um, for example, Burkhan, um, lower right hand here, is a commonly used biocide in aquaculture and uh, presumed and, and, and assumed to be effective for killing mollusks, including mud snails. However, acquiring this product um, from a general perspective requires purchasing it from an online manufacturer and creating a solution or mixing a solution of adequate concentration and maintaining that concentration to kill mud snails. Um, this is likely more steps than a casual fisher person wants to take when out there. So again, we wanted to evaluate some of the effectiveness of these chemicals as well as their practicality. And so to do this, um, <clears throat> we uh, acquired uh, 64 snails for the experiment using a four by two by two fully cross factorial design. Our chemicals that we tested were bleach, Vircon and Formula 409, bleach and Vircon both at the recommended concentrations, Formula 409 at the uh, already created concentration right off the shelf. <clears throat> um, we used control as water. We tested two different exposure durations. So two you know, time periods where mud snails were exposed or sprayed or, or uh, exposed to the chemical, 10 minutes and 20 minutes. And then two application types, whether it be spraying them 
or fully submerging, submerging them, um, i.e. bath. Uh, snails were assigned to designated treatment combinations, um, N equals 16 for each chemical, four for each treatment combination, and then we assessed mortality um, one to 96 hours post-exposure. And mortality was assessed based on uh, essentially movement And some, some quick results to share. So our results show that must snail mortality differed among decontaminants. So in this upper figure are the results from the decon trials, one, after expo one hour after exposure. And we see that all chemicals are significantly different than our control, which, is, which makes sense. Our post hoc test showed that formula 409 significantly worked better than, than Burkon. Formula 409 was in fact the most effective out of all three tested chemicals and they had a 100% mortality rate. Uh, exposure duration or application type influenced mud snail mortality. So no interaction effects were detected within treatments as we're seeing down here. Uh, performed a Kaplan-Meier survivorship analysis and this revealed that probabilities of mud snail survival 96 hours after exposure to be, um, just walk down the list, 100% for water, 62% for bleach, 18% um, for Vircon and 0% for Formula 409. And then significant differences were found between survivor survivorship functions of all chemicals ex um, except 409 and Vircon, which essentially means that Vircon is effective, but apparently not as effective as 409. So from the results, we've begun and continue to make recommendations working with all of our partners and um, with the public and with uh, user groups out there. Uh, we've created videos for effective decontamination strategies for anglers and water recreationists, um, uh, brochures, pamphlets, etc. And these can be found on the Mustnow website or by contacting myself or folks at Oakland University. Just reach out to info um, email if you'd like. And just some general conclu conclusions based on the presentation and the results so far, mudsnail populations in the Asaba River fluctuate seasonally and annually. Um, they can influence invertebrate community structure, function, and potentially food web dynamics. Uh, trout are increasingly consuming mudsnails as mudsnail densities increase. And then finally, use formula 409 if you're an invaded stream. <laughs> and that wraps it up for me. Um, just like to acknowledge all of our partners, there's many folks that have helped us out and collaborated with uh, many of these studies. So they're all listed here. Hopefully we didn't forget any. Um, our funding sources, of course. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. First one is, which water systems are a concern for future mud snail spread? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Jasmine? I think I'm... Which water systems are a concern for future mud snail spread? I assume probably in Michigan. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just one of those who have an opinion on this, but I think just to um, obvious reasons and logic, you know, that overlap between uh, a high level of recreation, um, fitting within the characteristics of mud snail invaded systems, you know, trout streams, more of a cold water type stream is where I think I'd put the most concern. So high level of traffic in the, in the watershed, um, a lot of anglers or boaters, um, again, along with kind of the characteristics of what makes a, a colder water stream, a trout stream. Uh, next question, are there any biological controls that we could introduce in North America that would be successful in controlling the population, such as parasites that are present in New Zealand? That's a good question, interesting one. As far as like a chemical means for control, you know, I'm obviously not one to speak totally on this, but I think we're, we're past um, looking at a chemical means to control populations like that of, of a lot of other invasive species. Totally eradication of an invasive species is probably pretty unprobable. It's just maintaining um, spread um, and preventing further spread, which is what I think management um, and uh, you know recreationists and users 
should focus upon. As far as the parasite um, option, I, there's not a lot of research into um, just the parasites outside of their native range in general, um, and whether that could be applied to biological control would be an intriguing and interesting subject to go on. So um, further research is certainly needed subject. Uh, kind of a related question, is there any known way to investigate the nutritional value that mud snails might have to possible predatory species? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Yep. Is there any known way to investigate the nutritional value that mud snails might have to possible predatory species? A way to evaluate the nutritional value of mud snails to predatory species. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, I don't have a really good answer for this. I think, uh, you know, trials such as, you know, such as Vincent and Baker 2008, you know, those who fed on mud snails versus non mud snails kind of gets to their nutritional value and their or maybe impacts to their health. Um, I think I lost the question again in my head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just um, ways to quantify nutritional value of mud snails. But, um, oh, yeah, you yeah, can do some. Yeah, I don't know, maybe some elemental stuff. Um, Scott's on the line, you could probably have a better idea than I do on that one. <laughs> yeah, you could put them in a bomb calorimeter, for example, and that would tell you the energy content within the snail. But the tricky thing is that, well, they have a shell. And so most fish consumers, at least, are not going to be able to tap into that or, you know, resource, um, even though it's present. And that's, I, that's one of the reasons that they're particularly problematic it's sort of a you know a trophic dead end where all the primary production and all this leaf litter makes its way into these mud snail populations and then it just stops there. And um, yeah, so thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to call you out anytime. <laughs> uh, it looks like someone sent a couple of questions directly to you, Jeremy. I don't know if you can see that on your end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I got to confirm my uh, volitional movement uh, units there, and I will do so. <laughs> I agree. Um, one is, what do I think of uh, is behind the seasonal fluctuations in, in their densities? Um, so this could be a number of reasons. Um, it might have to do with their pretty much uh, lifespan and life history throughout that year um, or throughout that time frame. Uh, where you know you have reproduction occurring during those peak times of the year. So in the summer, when we're seeing their highest numbers, um, might coincide with peak reproductive output as well. So we're getting a lot of juveniles or younger um, uh, age classes in our samples. Um, and then there may be a die off of that um, you know, reproductive uh, period throughout the winter. Um, causing kind of that fluctuation over time over the year there. Um, it could be an environmental thing um, going on where the winter is harsh here or, or in elsewhere where it causes more mortality than recruitment occurring and they pop back into um, uh, higher densities and abundances when uh, conditions become more suitable. Um, and then a number of other things as well too could go on. Um, I think that's a good question and one we're all trying to figure out or get more insight on. And then uh, lastly, could we do a isotope analysis from tissues of trout, um, thin clips, to assess the portion of their diet associated with NZMS? Um, and that's a great question too. We, we've tossed this around as well. Um, and yeah, I, I theoretically and hypothetically you could. Um, and it's not something that we're prepped to do, but we've certainly talked about it. <laughs> Well, that is all the questions that I have on my end, unless anybody has any last minute questions. I think we're, oh, one more. Um, what are reasons behind the large displacement of native macroinvertebrates? That's a good question too. The mechanism behind that um, displacement, um, it could be a couple different scenarios. One is that mud snails might be monopolizing available resources in the stream, whether it be food um, or space, uh, you know, if they get to these really elevated densities. So 
The densities that we were looking at were mean densities, so averaged out, but we've seen some localized densities of over 100,000 individuals per square meter. Um, that's up there, you know, by no means hundreds of thousands like they are seeing out west, but um, pretty impressive, especially relative to native invertebrate densities out there. So it could be a food issue with resource availability um, and or a space issue where, where west snails are just simply physically displacing them. Um, and maybe a couple other reasons too, but those are the ones that come to the top of mind. And one more kind of related question. Uh, do they have any alterations to the food web? Yes, yeah, so that isotope analysis kind of suggests and hints towards that. Um, you know, they, they have the ability to utilize multiple food resources, whether it be, you know, paraphyte and algae um, or detritus leaf litter affecting both, you know, multiple compartments of that food web and energy flow through the food web by monopolizing those resources, whereas otherwise it would be going to other taxa. Um, and given that mud snails aren't widely preyed upon, you know, begs the question of where does that, those nutrients and where does that energy flow to? Scott mentioned the trophic dead end. Um, it certainly halts energy flow to an extent um, around the food web because of their, you know, unavailability to be consumed by prey or at least assimilated by prey. That's all the questions that I've got. So I think uh, we can probably wrap it up. Thank you all so much for attending and um, have a good rest of your day and check out the other webinars that are posted on the website. Thanks nice talk, Jeremy, good job. Thank you. Thanks all for joining.